following presentation was recorded at the Academy for Lifelong Learning. The Academy provides adults ages 50 and older a learning environment of continued personal and intellectual growth. These classes are held in either the East Montgomery County Improvement District Building or in the LSC Atascacita Center. For more information, please call 281-312-1750 or visit the website at lonestar.edu slash ALL Kingwood. I do this every time I think I uh, over prepare. I end up finding out things that um, I was not expecting. And one of the things that I was not expecting, if you look at the title of this, Osceola and the Slave Revolt That History Forgot. Now I knew that uh, there were black Seminoles, that that was part of the story. But as I did uh, dug deeper and did more and more research, uh, what I found out was that this was the largest slave rebellion that ever took place in the United States or in North America. We've all been told in our history books that it was uh, that the biggest one was Nat Turner. He killed 68 people. It maybe involved a couple dozen slaves. Well, it turns out we just roll the slave rebellion into the Seminole War. And they are, they're both parallel and intertwined. So as I talk about Osceola, and it, it, this will be focused on Osceola, I am going to mention also a, another person, a black Seminole, uh, by the name of John Horse. And John, uh, just to give you a kind of a flavor of what was going on uh, with uh, the African Americans. If you are interested in John Horse, there is a website called johnhorse.com, and it is exceptional. It really gives you the information and very easy to read. Um, kind of, they'll show you a picture, they'll give you a paragraph, and then they move the story along. So if you're interested in that part, again, I'm not going to be able to tell you a lot about it, uh, but go to johnhorse.com uh, and uh, some interesting information. So. Let's talk about um, Osceola, the Seminole Wars, and the slave revolt that history forgot. Okay, there we have Florida, and this is actually a map that one of the generals, the American generals fighting Osceola, had crafted to show what he called the seat of war, where the war was taking place. Um, before we talk about Osceola, just like I do every time. I got to lay some groundwork. So let's talk about the Seminole. The name probably comes from the, uh, originally from the Spanish, meaning those who live apart. When the Spanish uh, came to uh, Florida, they found many different tribes and they were able to conquer those tribes are the tribes died out. Most of them died out from European diseases. Um, estimates are there were 100,000 Indians in Florida when the uh, uh, Spanish showed up. And by the time the Seminoles show up, who are not native to Florida, there were less than 500. So yeah, they, it, the uh, having the Europeans there, the, mainly the diseases, but also the way the Spanish treated them, they disappeared. However, there were some Indians there who the Spanish might have called them, those who live apart, or termed them wild and untamed. We can't control these like we can those that are uh, coming to the missions. Or possibly, they're just called the free people because they could never be conquered. The Seminole, again, most of the Indians who lived in uh, Florida at the time of the Spanish, I've got another map here, uh, included all these names that we don't recognize anymore. The Appalachian maybe, but up here are the Creek and the Choctaws. Now those we recognize, but all these others, they just die out, leaving Florida virtually empty. 
as um, England is colonizing up north, Georgia and all those places, uh, the Indians are being pushed out. And especially the Creeks who lived in southern uh, Georgia and southern Alabama. Farmers are, or settlers are coming in, they're wanting the land, they're pushing the Indians out. So Creeks, Creek Indians, who actually the Creeks are a confederation, they are several different tribes. We have a, um, we have two of them right here close by near Cleveland. The Alabama Cushada, back in these days, we would have just called them Creeks. Um, now they, they have their own name. But anyway, the Creeks are this confederation of tribes. But many of them said, you know, we don't want to have anything to do with the whites anymore. And they start coming down into Florida. So that's the Seminole. They are um, not a tribe in the sense that uh, we would have thought of tribes in the past. What they are, though, is one of the first tribes that are caused by whites, by the invasion of Europeans. Uh, over and over again, this will happen. Tribes will get broken up, and so they go to another tribe. A lot of times they were absorbed, but if enough tribes along the frontier are broken up, they are pushed out, and just for survival's sake, they come together, creating uh, new groups. Well, the Seminole are probably the, the most important of all those groups. Okay, uh, another part of this story, again, are uh, the black Seminoles, because the black Seminoles are accepted into uh, that society. They come from being runaways. There you've got Georgia right uh, north of there with plantations, and those down below in Florida you have freedom beckoning. The Spanish governor invited runaways to come to Florida for their freedom. Now what they had to do in some cases was they had to um, man, the, they had to take up arms and be soldiers or militia. So the, the Florida, it's not like there were a bunch of Spanish settlers. So to control Florida, they needed somebody there. Uh, more to keep Florida out of the hands of the English than because they really wanted Florida. It was just, you know, Florida is going to be ours, so we need somebody to do that. So they let it be known that you will gain your freedom if you come to Florida. Well, that makes it a place that people are going to run away. When we think about the um, Underground Railroad, we think of people going north. Well, if you were from the Carolinas or from uh, Georgia, you're going to go into northern Florida. These people kind of went through stages. Um, the, the runaways, once they escaped, oftentimes would create their own societies, their own villages, and they are called maroons. Now we've all heard the term marooned, or a maroon. Well, first, we've all heard the term marooned. We think of pirates. Right? Somebody is, uh, the pirates used to take someone they didn't want on their ship anymore, they drop them off in a, on a little deserted island. They are now marooned. Um, in this case, it is referring to the fact that from the beginning of um, the importation of African slaves to South America and, well, anywhere where the Spanish were, um, some of the slaves would escape and would create their own societies, you know, hide from, they would find the most undesirable place and hide from the Spanish who don't want to go into those undesirable places. So they create little villages there. From the Maroons, now this didn't always happen because some of this, these uh, runaways go and work for the Spanish, but from these Maroons, we have the Black Seminole. They evolve, they, they attach themselves to the Seminole tribes. Now that does not mean they lived with one another. What happened a lot of times is slaves would run away, they would find one of the, uh, the black Seminole villages and that, what they would find out is that village is a um, subsidiary, answers to 
a pure Seminole tribe or village nearby. They are under the protection of the Seminoles. They have certain obligations that to a white American at that time, looking at the situation, they would say, oh, those black Seminoles are slaves. When in fact, what the black Seminoles are doing is they're living free in their own villages with their own leaders, but they pay tribute. At harvest time, they're gonna bring some food to the Seminole village. Uh, the Seminoles were big on cattle, so they're gonna bring some good beef to um, the, the Seminole village. And for that, the rest of the time, they're free. So north of the border, you're a slave. If you can get across the border and get into one of these villages, you are free. And I mean, you're really free because you've got the Seminole protecting you, but you could also carry arms. So it's as free as these people are going to get, which means when we get into this war, who's gonna fight the hardest? It's going to be the black Seminoles because they are not going to have options that the Seminoles have. Now the whole point of this war was so that the Seminoles did not have to leave their homeland and go to Indian territory. Well, for black Seminoles, they don't even have that option. They're gonna get picked off by people in Georgia who say, you're my slave. So they're gonna fight to stay in Florida. So Seminoles and black Seminoles. And then again, there are also slaves in Florida. Once Florida becomes part of the Union, there are going to be slaves and they are going to participate too in a slave rebellion. Black Seminoles are not slaves. I mean, some of them could have been born slaves and escaped. Others are born free. That uh, uh, black Seminole leader that I mentioned, John Horse, was actually born free. So he had never been a slave, but he is going to uh, rally the slaves around him. Okay, this, now we're gonna talk about uh, Osceola again. Uh, born around 1804 in Alabama, he was a Creek Indian. Uh, his, his father was white and his mother was Creek, but she was Creek because of uh, the way they followed lineage, which was uh, maternally. You were whatever your mother was. His mother was only one quarter Creek. She was white otherwise but because her mother had been Creek, she's Creek. So really, Osceola, I don't, what's the math on that? I don't know how you do that, but I'm thinking three quarters white. Uh, he would tell people when he's an adult that no, he was full-blooded Seminole, which doesn't even make sense because the Seminoles are a, a tribe that comes together from other groups. And he would never speak English. He refuses to, though his father spoke English. Uh, he, his, name, his father's name was Powell. His name was Billy Powell. During the Creek War, which was simultaneous with the um, War of 1812, the, the Creek Indians broke into two groups. One group helped whites, assimilated to whites, and the other group wanted to fight the whites. Um, they were influenced by Tecumseh. So Tecumseh had come, the Shawnee had come down and, and kind of tried to get them to fight with him. And the Red Sticks, that was how they designated themselves, the Red Sticks said, we're going to fight the white people. Um, as always happens in war, it's the civilians who suffer. And his, his village was, was uh, destroyed by whites. When they came in, and as you can see, he fled to northern Florida. At about this time, John Horse was born, so I just put that there so you could know that. And he was welcomed by the Seminole because, again, the Seminole are very, their uh, traditions were pretty much Creek, not completely. Creeks did own slaves, by the way. Um, the Seminoles, the way it, uh, the research seems to go is that Creeks would say, yeah, we own those people but they said it in order to protect those people. If, if those people are owned, then that's the way it's gotta be. Um, the white slaveholders couldn't conceive of any other relationship, but a way to think about it might be a feudalism. 
the black Seminoles were vassals to the, the Seminoles. Okay, so um, at this time, uh, at the Creek War, he is going to end up in Florida. And he's got a good friend. Actually, he's not a friend at all. And Andrew Jackson seems to pursue him. Andrew Jackson was the one who uh, intruded with the whites into the Creek Civil War and uh, destroyed the Creek Confederacy. Um, by the way, he had, uh, during the Creek War, Andrew Jackson had Creek allies. Again, it was a civil war, so there's one group, the Red Sticks, who are fighting against the other group who liked the whites. Andrew Jackson used the Creeks, and then when he defeated the Red Sticks, he produced a treaty that said, here's the land I'm going to take. He not only took the Red Sticks land for the white people, but he also took his allies' land. And what he said, they protested, wait, we're your friends. And he said, why didn't you stab Tecumseh as soon as he came into your village? You should have stabbed him right away. He's the one who's causing all the problems. So that was his excuse. So the Creek Sea, he's not their friend. By the way, he got, Andrew Jackson got the nickname at that point of a long knife because he is a long knife aimed at the uh, Indians. He, uh, when I, I'm kind of playing fast and loose with the truth here when I say he's pursuing him. He's pursuing the Creeks or he's pursuing Florida. What Jackson, and it seems like I've told you all this, but um, think of Andrew Jackson through his heritage. He was Scots-Irish. So he was, his family had been in a clan back in Scotland. And coming to America, he decided that all of white America were his clan. And so he's fighting the other clans, the red clans. And what he's going to do is get the land for his clan. He is, it's perfectly natural for him uh, I don't think he had any personal animosity against Indians other than the fact that, you know, they weren't of his clan. So you hate everyone else who's not in your clan. Uh, so anyway, he is going, uh, he's, he's famous at this, uh, after the Creek War, n not so much for the Creek War as the Battle of New Orleans. Uh, but then he gets appointed uh, the protector of the southern border, and that's where it, uh, they're going to clash. Okay, he is going to get in, uh, by he I mean Jackson, Jackson's going to get into the first Seminole War. By protecting uh, the southern border, he is going to keep his eye on Florida <coughs> and want Florida for whites. Um, during the War of 1812, the British had decided that one of the ways they could defeat America was through the uh, Gulf of Mexico. I mean, that's why they invaded or tried to take New Orleans. That was their main thrust. But they also saw Spanish Florida, and it was controlled by Spain at that time, as a good base. You know, from, from there you can raid up into Georgia and those places. And so the British had some, um, a few soldiers there, and they created a a uh, fort called the British Post and it was on the Apalachicola River so that's the I believe the border river between Alabama and Florida um, and they were going to launch some attacks from there it never happened the war came to an end and the British abandoned the fort gave it over to runaway slaves slaves coming down from Georgia and they occupied this fort, and it went from being called the British Post to the Negro Fort. 300 or more African Americans lived in this fort. They were all runaways. But it's also a natural beacon then to all the slaves that are still up in Georgia. There is a place, an actual fort, where you can be safe. So Jackson said, we've got to get rid of this place. It's causing too many problems with slaves running away. Um, so he sent some soldiers on boats to attack the fort. Uh, what you see here 
uh, is uh, some slave or escaped slaves getting ready or firing at some American gunboats. This was a very strong fort. The British had designed it. They left all their munitions there. The um, runaway slaves should have been able to hold out forever. But a lucky shot from the gunboat, the gunboat, uh, they were heating their shells so that when they exploded, I guess it would cause fire or something. Uh, but it landed right in the middle of the magazine, the powder magazine. It blew the fort sky high. Out of the 300 people there, 290 something died immediately. Just wiped them out. Um, so now the Americans come in, even though it's Spanish <coughs> Florida, and they are going to eventually build their own fort there. The slaves who had not uh, been actually in the fort, there were, there were a slave community up and down the river. These are people who have run away. So uh, runaways are maroons. We can call them maroons because that's what they're called in Florida. Um, they vowed revenge. We want to we wanna strike back because you've destroyed this symbol to us, the symbol of freedom. So <coughs> Seminoles and Creeks in the area, and by Seminoles I also mean black Seminoles, began to raid north of the border. And their purpose was to get revenge. Uh, they are killing innocent people. They're burning down um, buildings. They're stealing stock. They are raiding. <coughs> the home that uh, Osceola, or Billy Powell, because he's still known as Billy Powell at this time, um, the place where he ended up in Florida was called Fowl Town, and it was led by uh, this chief. And when the fort was uh, blown up <coughs> and American troops built their own fort, they began to march into uh, Florida to you know, punitively destroy the uh, Seminole. And this chief said, you come anywhere near here and we'll, you know, we'll push you back. Well, that's an invitation then for them to come in. And that's what they're going to do. They're going to come into this town and destroy it. They're going to burn it to the ground. Uh, they took Billy Powell prisoner. Now, he's, he's just a, a 14 or 15 at this time, but for a while he was actually a prisoner of the Americans, uh, and he was noticed. Uh, apparently he always had a great bearing. The way he carried himself was impressive. Uh, so he was noticed uh, by these American soldiers. He's released, and now he's got to find a new home again. So twice now he has lost his home. <coughs> I mean, and really lost it. His whole town's gone because of whites. So he's kind of picking up a, an image here. <coughs> Probably don't hang around white people. And he's going to move down close to Tampa Bay. Okay, some uh, more things about the first Seminole War. Uh, Billy Powell's not fighting it. He's too young yet. Uh, but President Monroe had his eyes on Florida. There was a side uh, bar there a uh, little earlier where it said Congress had secretly told the president, you can take Florida. So we were coveting Florida, which is kind of interesting because we didn't really want the land. What's going to happen afterwards, once we get all this, settlers come in and we raise some stock there but other than that northern band which has some good land we didn't want all that stuff where we pushed the Seminole when we attacked the Seminole we didn't want that land what did we want what did white people want they wanted the slaves the runaway slaves it was about this these wars are about getting those slaves back as long as those slaves those, those free men, as long as free blacks who carry guns exist in Florida, that is a danger to the entire system of slavery in the South. Okay, so here, uh, there's some controversy about this. Um, Jackson, or President Monroe told Jackson to stop the raids. Jackson took that as meaning I'm going into Florida, and he just went ahead and did it, even though there were people in Congress who didn't want him to do it without official sanction. Later, when he runs for president, there's some controversy about that, you know, because you do the digging and you 
find stuff on them and they're going to blame, you know, say he was just out of control, which in a way Jackson was always like that. I mean, he was always out of control. Um, the war was just over quickly. There, it, it wasn't much of a war when you start reading about it. Uh, I think maybe it got its name after we had the second one and then the third one. Then it's like, oh, we see a pattern here of the Seminole resisting. Um, he just penetrated into the north of the um, country or state, territory, whatever it was then. Uh, he never went uh, deep into the country. He hated Florida. Weather was bad. He didn't want to be there. He's actually appointed governor. I think he stayed four months, maybe not even that long. Uh, he just didn't like it. So he's going to get out of there after winning Florida. Um, he had, by the way, when he won the war, that didn't mean we had Florida. Uh, he had to retreat because it's still part of Spain. But what that told the Spanish was that they can't hold Florida. It's impossible to hold Florida against a strong young United States. So in 1819, there was a treaty signed uh, where we get Florida and we give or we forgive Spain $5 million in debt. At this time, Spain was in serious trouble. Their empire was crumbling. Uh, it will be just a couple of years before Mexico uh, declares their independence. So Spain was in some serious trouble. Um, as it says there, Billy Powell was forced to move yet again. He's going to move down to the Tampa Bay area. But he is now a teenager, and he goes through a ceremony, which is um, that every year they have what's called the green corn ceremony. And if you look throughout uh, different Indian cultures, you'll see they have some kind of green corn uh, ceremony. But this is a time where a boy becomes a man, chooses his name, or his name is chosen for him. And uh, part of the process of the green corn uh, ceremony is to drink this nasty, awful black gunk that they get from some plant or some mixture of plants that basically makes you vomit copiously. The point is to purge you. You're going to become a new person. So when he went through this, everybody else is feeling sick and horrible. I'm not saying he didn't feel sick and horrible because he vomited like everyone else, but he came out singing. He's happy to be a man, to be purged of all of his past. And so Osceola, which again, that's a corruption, the way we say it as corruption, means a black drink singer. He is now Seminole, and he would always say that I am full blood Seminole would deny his white blood. Uh, at this time, John Horse is a boy of six or seven. Uh, he too lived in the northern part of Florida, so he is forced to move uh, deeper into Florida as well. The following presentation was recorded at the Academy for Lifelong Learning. The Academy provides adults ages 50 and older a learning environment of continued personal and intellectual growth. These classes are held in either the East Montgomery County Improvement District Building or in the LSC Atascacita Center. For more information, please call 281-312-1750 or visit the website at lonestar.edu slash all kingwood. Okay, now we're going to have to talk about some treaties because the treaties, Americans don't just seize land. We seek some kind of legal fig leaf, some, ex, not, not excuse for the land, but uh, legal cover. So the first one of these treaties that is going to help uh, whites steal the land is the Moultrie Creek Treaty of 1823. 
It took the Seminole, who again lived more up north, and it restricted them. They had 28 million acres. It restricts them to 4 million acres, the green portion here. So they did get Disney World. <laughs> uh, they just held on. Um, but notice they don't get any coastline, so there, there's no external contact that's going to be possible. Uh, it turns out, or it's pretty obvious, that there were seven, I believe it was, uh, chiefs who signed this treaty. And they signed the treaty, but they themselves are not obligated to the terms of the treaty. They don't have to move. They get some money and they get their own private little reservations in the northern part of, of uh, Florida, so estates. But they, their people have to move to this land. If you've ever been to central Florida, I was there a few years ago, you know, it's Pine Barrens or Swamp. It's not good land to grow things and the, the Seminole are going to go hungry being there, getting there, well, the, let's put it this way. The governor of Florida, after the Seminole were, were forced there, he visited there once. And he came out and he said, that is the worst land I have ever seen. And we're forcing these people to live there. So guess what the Seminole are going to do? They are going to leave that area and go out searching for food. And they're going to bump into white settlers. And somebody's going to get killed. So then there will be... Um, soldiers called in to fix the problem. So, but that's where they went. At the same time, Osceola now is an adult and he becomes the policeman for his band of Seminole. And I'm, there's several of these words I'm really going to mask here, but I'm going to say Tustanugi. Tustanugi, that's what it means, policeman. Um, so that is his job as an adult. By the way, the Creeks had policemen too. Um, these were people to, that did keep um, tribesmen doing what they're supposed to do. So he's got his adult job now. Seminoles have lost their land, the land that they liked, and they are forced into a barren land. Okay. Osceola marries. He married a young girl, about 10 years younger than him, uh, named Morning Dew. And there is a great possibility that she was black, that she was a black Seminole, though there's no definite proof other than the way he acted. Um, and that was not unusual for black Seminoles to marry uh, the, the, not full blood Seminoles, but the Seminoles, uh, even though it wasn't as prevalent as you might think because, again, two separate towns, two separate villages. They don't uh, live together. Um, but he went to visit a town uh, and saw this uh, young girl, and I don't know if it was love at first sight, but he decided he was going to marry her. Again, her name was uh, Morning Dew. One of the stories that came out of uh, the legend of Osceola was that the reason he began to fight the white man was because um, Morning Dew had been captured by slave uh, hunters. The newspaper article you see there is from 1839 and it shows the um, whites taking away his African-American wife. Again, there's no proof that that happened in that particular case, but that would not have been unusual. There were slave hold holders coming down searching for uh, black Seminoles and runaways all the time, and the Seminoles protected them. And he certainly was sympathetic to them at the very least. Okay, now a little bit more about John Horse. Uh, by 1826, John Horse was 14 or 15, and um, he had had to move further into California. Uh, just outside of Tampa, the army had built, where is it? Camp Brook, and there were soldiers there led by Lieutenant Colonel George M. Brook. Uh, this, again, this, this land is not the greatest land. 
Um, when Brooke got there, he would eat some of the local fare and he didn't like anything. He didn't like any of it, except for Florida gophers. Oh. It's a terrapin. They burrow into the ground. So they are called gophers or gopher turtles. Florida gophers. Um, one day, uh, a black Seminole boy comes walking into the camp. Now, th by the way, this is kind of unique too, it's kind of telling. Um, this camp will take you if you're a, you know, they look for runaway slaves, the army as slave hunters. Uh, but black Seminoles, they don't touch. So he comes in and out of the village, and he comes into the village one day carrying a bag with two big gophers. And he offers to sell them to, the, to Colonel Brook, who has discovered that he loves gopher meat. And so um, the colonel met the young man and paid him a princely sum at the time. I don't, they said a quarter. I don't know if that's with inflation or without, but um, paid him a quarter for it. And then said, boy, if you can bring me more, I'll pay you for them. He told John Horse, that's who it is, to go and put the two turtles in a pen. The next day, John Horse shows up and he's got two more turtles. He sells them to the uh, commander. The next day, he sells him some more turtles. For a week, he sells him turtles. And at the end of the week, the colonel, he's going, I've got so many turtles out there. I'm going to have a feast. I'm going to have all the people come, you know, all the officers come in, and we're going to have a feast of gopher meat. He went out to, y'all see this coming. <laughs> he goes out to the uh, pen. There are two terrapin there. And he got very angry and um, said, find, find this kid. Uh, they found John Horse. They brought him back. And he's actually kind of waving his sword at him and says, um, you know, why did you do this? And John Horse thought very quickly and said, well, I just didn't want to disappoint you. You seem like you really wanted me to be bringing you gophers. And the colonel started laughing. He had been so angry he was going to punish him. But for some reason, that tickled him. And he said, well, thanks for what you did, Gopher John. So for much of his life, one of his nicknames was Gopher John. By the way, the reason he's called John Horse, his father was a Spaniard, and um, Cavallo was his name, which apparently is some corruption of horse. Um, so he's, he's known by several different names, but I like the Gopher story. All right, Andy Jackson, who fought the first Seminole War and has had his eye on Florida, is elected president in 1828. In his first inaugural, well, not his inaugural address, but the State of the Union, um, he m talks to the problem of Eastern Indians, of Indians who still live east of the Mississippi River. And he says they've got to be removed. He said, but we'll remove, if you read his, uh, this address, he sounds very friendly to them. Oh, I'm doing this for your own good. It's going to be great for you. And you're going to get land west of the Mississippi, and you're going to own it as long as the grass grows and the rivers run, or the Sooners show up and take it away from you, because that's what happens. Um, by the time he becomes president in 1829, he's inaugurated in 1829, uh, there were about 125,000 Indians left. And that's northern Indians, southern Indians, the whole bit. He has passed in his first administration uh, the Indian Removal Act. We've got to get rid of that 125,000 uh, Indians. We have to get that <coughs> land for whites. By the way, at first, Indian territory was not Oklahoma. It was Arkansas, but before they had even <coughs> transplanted too many Indians to Arkansas, there were too many whites there. And so 
even at the beginning when they were promised as long as the grass grows and the rivers run, well, it's not going to be the Arkansas River now, it's going to be further over. Again, they look at the Seminoles. By the way, the Seminoles are, are uh, one of the five civilized tribes, uh, the most civilized, the most adapted to whites, uh, were the Cherokees. Uh, one of the things that, that makes you civilized is if you adopt um, white man's clothing. And the Seminoles had. Almost all the pictures you will see, they're wearing some kind of uh, cloth as opposed to deer skins and those things. Um, so they are always put in with the five civilized tribes. But again, when Jackson is looking at them and when other people are looking at the um, Seminole, it's not for the land in the same way that the Cherokee land or the <coughs> Creek land or any of that other land. Settlers wanted that land. Removing the Choctaw and the Creeks from that land meant that you got the very best cotton growing land in the South. So there was a definite reason uh, to take that land. In this case, it was more we can, if we remove the Indians, they are the ones protecting the runaway slaves. We get those slaves. Now there, there was also though, the fact that Seminoles were, uh, were raising cattle and if you remove them, you can't remove the cattle as well. So you can get that land and get the cattle. So they are, again, as it says, they are uh, pushed to conform. All right, another treaty. Payne's Landing, which is in um, Florida. An American diplomat calls the uh, seven or I think it was eight this time, uh, chiefs to the landing and says, you got to go. Well, we don't want to go. They're going to bribe the uh, chiefs. And as, as you can see here, it says um, there's still debate about what went on at this treaty, how it was that these chiefs who publicly were saying, we're not going to sign this, we don't want to go, ended up signing it. Apparently, he pushed uh, them and lied to them. This is kind of important. How do they, they don't speak English. One of the reasons the black Seminoles and the runaway slaves were so important to the Seminole was because they spoke English. They also spoke the Seminole language, which by the way, there was kind of, a, uh, they had several languages because they had several tribes, but there was one they kind of settled on. It was kind of the one that uh, was used most. So. If you were a runaway slave or you were a free Seminole and you knew English and that language, you became the interpreter. But that doesn't mean you know all the subtleties of what's going down on that piece of paper. Maybe you can't read, but you can speak. So a white man can write anything on that, that uh, treaty and then they, set, they tell the translator, this is what's going on, and they turn around and tell the, the Indian. So it can be a problem. Uh, this treaty gets the chiefs to um, agree to go to what is now Oklahoma. They moved them out of Arkansas into the Indian Territory. By the way, they did, uh, uh, the government did this typically with uh, at least the, the Cherokee and the Creeks as well, where they sent delegates. See how good the land is. And I'm not going to say anything bad about Oklahoma, uh, but you know the eastern part of the state is very different from the western part. Uh, I've been to where the Cherokee um, ended up. I think it's beautiful. I think it's beautiful country, uh, but it might have been too different, especially for the Seminole. Uh, Cherokee could, you know, they could get used to the, the the mountains and stuff because they had mountains where they lived. But for the Seminole, this would have been very different. So they were brought there, and um, one of the things that they were told is, you're going to get your own land, but we're going to administer uh, the U.S. government. We're going to administer to you as part of the Creek concession. Well, the Creeks who did not come to Florida didn't like the Creeks who went to Florida. They were enemies. So to say we're going to put you in with the Creeks is we're going to give the Creeks power over you. So they didn't really want to do that. Uh, but at this 
uh, Fort Gibson, which by the way is, is still there. You can visit it. I was there a few years ago. There's not a lot to see, but you can go there. Um, it's on the banks of the, which river? It's not the Arkansas. I can, it'll come to me in a minute. Um, they set these guys down and they forced them to put their mark down. They lied to them. They changed the terms of the treaty. In the first treaty, or in, in the Payne's Landing treaty, treaty, it said, you're gonna go look at the land and then when you come back, if they should be satisfied, means if the Seminole should be satisfied with what the representatives tell them, we'll move, you'll move. That's what Payne's uh, Landing Treaty said. But the whites changed afterwards, changed the uh, writing in the new treaty, so it said, should this delegation agree that it's good? There's a big difference there. If the delegation goes back and says, look, we think it's nice, it's got rolling hills, blah, 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 and the Seminoles go, okay, we'll go, that's one thing. But to just say seven people decide, yes, we'll move. And it was something that they did not agree to, it was changed later. So the U.S. government lied to the Indians, first time, only time. <laughs> <laughs> So they get back, the, the seven chieftains get back. They meet at a fort where the uh, Indian agent, a man named Wiley Thompson, is going to say, we got to go now. You, there's no more waiting. We're going to move a third of you this year. And everybody threw their hands up and said, we're not going. There's resist opposition to this idea. And he won't put up with it. He bullies the chiefs. The, the, uh, the Seminole did have a head chief, though it was mainly ceremonial. His name was Micanope. Uh, that's him there. And they called him old and fat and lazy to his face. They're calling him all, uh, uh, Thompson's calling him all these names. And Micanope went back and forth about whether to sign it or not. But he has someone standing behind him who is going to give him a little backbone. Um, well, well, before we get there. The reason they're so worried is because in this treaty it says you're going to turn over your runaway slaves. There's no more of this shielding them. You're going to turn them over. Uh, the black Seminoles uh, the tribe is worried about as well because you've got to travel through the south to get to Indian territory. And you are going to, you're going to have people showing up saying, you're my slave. So they want some kind of protection for that before they'll even consider it. Uh, at any rate, here's where we have the emergence of Osceola. Before this time, he was just being a good policeman, doing his job, keeping people in line but he had not interfered with the politics at all. But when Thompson presents the treaty and puts it on a table for everyone to sign, does anybody know what happens? It's kind of his famous defiant thing. He pulls out his knife and slams it into the treaty, into the table, and it just sits there doing this, and he says, this is the only treaty I will make. There he is plunging it into the... Now, whether he really did that, there's some question about maybe he just waved his knife around or whatever, but the legend is he did this, but it shows his defiance. That's it, and he, he, he is going to be the spark that starts the Second Seminole War and leads the Second Seminole, Seminole War. Um, Micanopy will be around, but he basically does what Osceola says. By the way, the whites still only knew him as Billy Powell. And so they were going, Powell just kind of went nuts. They, they had known him. I mean, he, he had gone into white settlements and things like that. But now he's saying, no, we're not going to leave. Which may add credence to the idea that his wife was African American. Because if she goes, she either gets taken by slaveholders when they come into Florida are on the trip over. So this may be, uh, again, some people say it's circumstantial, but uh, this may prove that he had an a African-American wife. 
he was very, um, well, he was arrogant. I'm talking about Osceola. And he was very angry, and he did not know how to hide his anger. So he's, uh, he kind of leaves at this point, leaves the fort, but then he comes back. And every time he comes back, he's belligerent, and he's telling other Indians, you're not going, and uh, I'll kill you. And Thompson has him arrested and thrown into the, the stockade. And for a couple of days, he just goes nuts. He's tearing the thing up. He is, he is wild. And Thompson told him, you're never getting out of there till you calm down. And it says, overnight. He was very calm. He apologized for what he had done. He even promised he'd bring his band of Seminole uh, back in so that they could be some of the first that were transported. Thompson was so thrilled. He said, he's a good Indian now, and gave him a, a beautiful rifle as a reward for calming down. Osceola has not calmed down, but it's come over him that it's better if he looks like a, uh, a sheep rather than a wolf, and he leaves. When he leaves, they are prep, they under, uh, the Seminole understand that war is going to occur. One of the things that the black Seminoles do is they go uh, to plantations along the St. Johns River. The St. Johns River is on the eastern portion of Florida. I'll show you a map in a second. And um, they are, just walking onto the plantations and telling the slaves, get ready. There's going to, you know, we'll, we'll supply weapons for you and you can rise up. So uh, these were sugar plantations all up and down the St. John's River. And uh, that was the only thing that was prosperous for, for whites in Florida. Oh, I didn't tell you about that. All right, so they're preparing. Osceola is preparing as well. There are some Seminole who are willing to go. One of them was a chief named Charlie Ithmathla, and he, was, uh, he went into, I think it was Camp Brook, and received payment for preparing to take or bring his people in. And of course, to Osceola, this is a bribe. And so uh, Osceola caught up to him on the road. They had an argument. Osceola murdered Charlie. That's Charlie over there. And when he did this, he made sure nobody took the money that, he, that Charlie was given, but he pulled the money out and sprinkled it over his body. And he said, there's your payment. Nobody leaves Florida. So he is an enforcer. Remember, he had been a policeman. So he, he's going to enforce his new law. So the war finally shows up. This was all earlier in 1835. The war uh, comes in December of 1835, at the end of the year. Just so you know, at this t to kind of give you a timeline, um, the Chickasaw had already left for Oklahoma. Uh, some of the Choctaw had left, but the uh, Cherokee won't leave until 1838. They're fighting legal battles. They're not going to fight with guns. They're going to fight legal battles to try to keep, uh, to stay in Georgia. All right, so the war begins with assassination and slaughter. On December 28, 1835, Osceola led 60 warriors in an attack on Fort King. Osceola leads men to Fort King with the purpose of killing Thompson, the man who said he was now a good Indian. And it was dark. Uh, Thompson and another man walked out after dinner, and uh, 60... Seminoles shot him dead, uh, and one of them was Osceola with the rifle that was given to him by Thompson. So is that justified? I think sometimes people want to just, everyone's, everything's noble about Osceola or Tecumseh or whatever. This seems almost petty to me. This seems like personal vindictiveness. But then again, Thompson was not like a great guy either. He had been bullying the, the Indians. Um, while 
Osceola is doing this while he's assassinating uh, Wiley Thompson. There is a, n a larger group of, of Seminole who are waiting on this road for a detachment of American soldiers who are marching between those two forts. They are changing base. It is the slaughter, it's the Dade Massacre. Um, Major Francis Dade with 108 soldiers is ambushed on the road. They had the perfect spot. They were led there by a black Seminole who was helping the white man. By the way, later on in the war, one officer said, they never do that. They never turn on each other. And it is interesting that as soon as they got to that spot, the black Seminole dropped to the ground before there were any shots. Hmm. Maybe he led them to this point because the Seminole attack and they kill all but, a, uh, all but three, and one of those three was actually the Black Seminole. The battle went on for quite a while, uh, but they killed every one of them. This is, we don't hear much about this, but that's a pretty big deal, having over 100 uh, soldiers killed uh, by American Indians. Um, they were robbed, but they were not, uh, I'm sorry, they were not robbed, but they were scalped. And that night, Osceola and the, uh, there, was, there was a Seminole chief named Alligator, or called Alligator, uh, I don't know why they do that in Florida, um, who, they got together and they danced around the scalps of some of the men that uh, they had killed. There is a legend that uh, runaway slaves came across the bodies and mutilated them later. Uh, it's probably propaganda because they didn't even find these bodies for several months. When they found them, they were essentially skeletons. So um, anyway, it was a big victory, but at the same time, what that did was it allowed Southerners to say to Northerners, look, they're attacking us, they're killing American soldiers, and Northern congressmen who weren't necessarily in favor of this, which I'll tell you why in a moment, have to agree to it. You know, it's the patriotic thing to do. Northerners from the beginning were a little uneasy about this war because of the slave issue. How much of this is about slavery as opposed to about removing Indians. They didn't really care about removing Indians, that's okay, but it's the fact that so many of, or, or so much of this is really so we can get our hands on slaves. Almost immediately thereafter, um, the first of several commanders that Osceola will defeat gets a bunch of men together and is going to go into the haven that the uh, Seminole have along the Withlacoochee River, which is north of Tampa. Uh, it's almost impregnant, impreg you can't get in. Uh, area of wild swamps and tangled undergrowth, uh, and yet it's close to those roads and those, uh, install uh, those uh, installations where uh, Osceola can strike when he wants to and then go back into this jungle. In these swamps, in a lot of Florida, you have what are called hammocks. And a hammock is simply high ground. It's ground that's three or four feet higher than the rest of the ground around it. Uh, and then because it's higher, it's got trees, typically uh, hardwood trees growing there in, in great abundance. And so you as a Seminole want to defend that land. You will get on that land it's, a, it's advantageous to you, and then when the soldiers come to charge you, they're going through the swamp. They're getting stuck in the mud. Uh, horses were useless, so you can't use cavalry. So the uh, Indians were very good about finding the hammocks and uh, protecting those. Uh, basically what happened, uh, the, the American general is marching down one side of the river, but to get to the cove, to get to the cove, he has to cross the river. There was only one place where you could cross, the, where you could wait across a ford. Osceola knew he was going to have to come there. He set his men up on the hammock just across 
from uh, the Ford. And as the whites started coming over, he let some of them over. You always want to divide the enemy's force. And then his men opened up on them. And they just killed, uh, actually they didn't kill that many, they wounded quite a few people. Um, and the forces are divided. It probably would have been a massacre, except Osceola was wounded. And one of the weaknesses of, of Indian warfare was that so often they looked to their combat leader, their chief, uh, as you know, we're following him. To see him wounded kind of takes the wind out of their sails. And so he kept wanting to fight, but he was obviously hurt. And so his men finally gave way. The general did not pursue him. He's had enough. He lost four men. Uh, killed, but dozens wounded. So he hightails it back to the fort. While that's going on, you have over where that red circle is, that's the St. John's River, you have uh, the sugar plantations, the slaves rise up. The quote that you see there is important because this is from the general who gets credit for winning the war. Uh, the American general wanted people to recognize this is a Negro, not an Indian war, and if it be not speedily put down, the South will feel the effects of it on their slave population before the end of the next season. These are ruins of plantations. They're all up and down the St. John River. You can go visit them. They were burned down in this single insurrection, about a dozen of them. The sh uh, after they removed all the Indians and uh, the sugar industry never uh, recovered. So it, they're, they're all just runs there now. That's John Horse. It's the only picture of him as a young man that we have. Uh, but they rose up, killed dozens of whites. Whites ran away um, and again abandoned their homes. But why don't we know about this? One of the reasons was even then when reports like this from uh, General Jessup was his name uh, make it to Washington, the news is suppressed because you don't want to believe that slaves can do this. So you lie to yourself. You lie to the people. No, they would never, you know, they could never be this organized and destroy this much, which is why we don't know a lot about this. Our, in history, it's forgotten. Okay, um, the first man who was defeated uh, gets replaced, and eventually, overall, Osceola defeats six different American commanders, five of whom were generals. Gaines, is, uh, which that gentleman there, uh, was a uh, War of 1812 hero. He was in charge of Louisiana at the time. Uh, he was sent over. Oh, uh, before we get to what Gaines actually did. After a while, and this is not with Gaines, but just overall, American officers started avoiding duty in Florida. There is no glory there. It's, just, it's a miserable place. You're likely to die. You're not going to, to rise in the ranks because of it. And generals almost always said sort of the opposite. Oh, just put me in Florida, I'll take care of it. Until they were there, and then they ended up sending notes back saying you can't win this war. Every one of them did that, by the way. Can't win it. So uh, it's kind of interesting how they viewed this. Uh, Osceola, or Gaines comes in from the same direction, is going to go to the cove of the Withlacoochee, and marches down the side of the road, or I'm sorry, side of the river, and this time Osceola crosses the river and strikes him on the other side of the river. Um, Gaines was surprised. He wasn't expecting it. His men basically just kind of in the open, uh, in, a, in the forest, I may have a picture of it later, um, where there are a lot of pine trees, but there's not a lot of undergrowth. They just kind of get in a big circle and start chopping down some trees and stuff, and they build a small fort-like area, and the Seminole lay siege to them. 
And it got to the point where Gaines, uh, uh, Osceola sends a, a, sends a uh, messenger and saying, let's discuss terms. And General Gaines says, okay. So he's going to discuss terms of surrender. And then the cavalry showed up, just like the Old West, except they were infantry. Some, a relief column comes up and uh, struck the Seminole from behind, and so the Seminole take off. It's what saved Gaines. Uh, Gaines declared victory and then said, I am, by the way, I'm, I'm needed uh, anywhere else. And he goes back to Louisiana. Um, Osceola, when he was wounded, it took so much out of him that, uh, or in, in coordination with it, uh, he got some kind of tropical illness, which was not unusual down in Florida. So, so uh, Osceola is in, an, he has bouts of illness, and at sometimes it clouds his judgment. Uh, because, or, or he just can't participate. And that's when usually the soldiers make uh, inroads on the Seminole. Okay, and here I am. General Malaria and General Jessup. Jessup is uh, the fifth commander. I skipped some of these others. They were all useless. They all go into the swamp, declare victory, and then get out as soon as they can. Um, Jessup is uh, put in charge because the last general had to, um, had to deal with general malaria or the sickly season. Uh, up there, campaign season is in winter in Florida. That's when you want to uh, go and fight because it's too hot and too sickly from May to October. They had said, we're not going to go fight anybody. We're just going to stay in our forts. In succession, they had to start closing the fort because there was nobody that was still healthy enough to man them. So if the Seminoles had realized that, they could have come in and killed all those people. So they just closed fort after fort in the interior and came back to the coast until it's time to campaign again. Uh, Jessup is uh, chosen. That's Jessup there, Thomas Jessup. And he has a new plan. Instead of sending out these huge armies that just blunder around, he's going to strike fast. He's going to have hit and run uh, forces that go out, and he's going to target not Osceola, not the warriors. He's going to target women and children. Let's capture women and children, then the men will come in. Also, we're going to strike the black Seminoles. We're going to separate them from the other Seminoles. And in fact, he will offer terms to the other Seminoles saying, you know, just give us your blacks, and, and you're, you're okay, you're good. And this war goes on and on and on. And after a while, there's some of the Seminoles who are willing to do that, trade their safety for uh, their relatives or, or not relatives. Uh, not relatives? Anyway. Um, Jessup's lightning strikes into the swamp seems to work. He captures 105 uh, Seminoles. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, but that was more than the other five generals had captured up to that point. Now some had voluntarily gone in, but actually captured, he's got many more. Uh, so his strategy seems to be working. Uh, he, he attacked John Horse's uh, village. As you can see, he t stole uh, 90 of uh, John Horse's uh, cattle. That was a big blow. But it only worked to a certain extent because Osceola is so hard-willed that he's willing to let, to lose some of his men. He's not going to leave. And so Jessup's strategy after a while just seems to have not gone anywhere. Um, so he goes around Osceola and gets other chiefs to come in and as you can see, they, because their condition, uh, he kept them running around so much that they couldn't get food, so they're starting to come in. Um, he had gotten over 700 at Tampa Bay waiting for ships to sell them to New Orleans and then go up the Mississippi River and cross over into uh, Indian Territory.
But then look down here. Um, Osceola comes in, surrounds the camp, all 700, went to the chiefs who had said, we'll go to Florida and force them to tell their people we're out of here. So he stole them all back. He got every one of them. And now Jessup is angry because what he's done hasn't worked. And so he's going to decide on something treacherous. No longer felt any compunction about using uh, trickery to gain his ends. Basically what he's going to do over and over again is say, let's parlay. Well, uh, here's the white flag. You're protected. You can leave when it's over. And then they come in and he takes them prisoner. Over and over again he did this. He did this because, as it said, th these are his words. I have the honor of reporting that this campaign has entirely failed. All is lost, and principally, principally by the influence of the Negroes, because they're not going. If they try to, you know, they, they're not going to make it to, to uh, Oklahoma. So they keep kind of pushing the Seminole. All the primary chiefs are uh, taken prisoner and put in a, a Fort Marion which is a uh, fort on the East Coast. Osceola and Cohadjo. Cohadjo had already agreed to give up blacks, and he probably betrayed Osceola. Probably the only person who, who would betray the Seminoles, but he wants his own safety. So um, he tells Osceola, let's go in on a white flag, and then he is made prisoner, and they are imprisoned at Fort Marion, and I just put a side note there. Uh, this is where they also sent the Apache, including Geronimo, at the end of the Indian Wars. They stayed there two years. Imagine an Apache who's used to things that are always dry getting stuck in a place like that. It would have been miserable. Osceola, still suffering from malaria or some uh, other disease, um, was sent to Charleston, there's a fort called Fort Moultrie, and he was sent there to uh, be held as a prisoner. Uh, Kohadjo was with him, and Kohadjo kind of um, basically is going to tell white people what they want to hear. And so he's going to say, Osceola gave up. He realizes that he could never win. Um, almost certainly he was paid off. Um, Osceola was sick the entire time he's there. It's only a matter of, of a few months. Um, George Catlin drew the famous picture of him. Uh, they say it was, everyone who saw this said it was very much like who he was. Um, he died in 1838, and you can see this is a newspaper who's saying, we disclaim all participation in the glory of this achievement, because after all, you just took him uh, you deceived him under a white flag. But I want to tell you a couple of other things about the death of Osceola, or the aftermath. Um, the doctor who took care of him, the army doctor who took care of him, was the brother-in-law of Wiley Thompson, the man that Osceola had assassinated. Um, when Osceola died, <coughs> The doctor talked to the captain uh, the, in charge of the fort, and uh, they said, we are not sending back any of his property to his family. His family's not going to get any of this. And they basically robbed him and took them as souvenirs. But they're not done. The doctor cut off Osceola's head and pickled it and kept it for the family. And um, that was, seemed to be a legend, because he didn't make money off of it. He wasn't, you know, he'd show it to you if you came to his home or something. Uh, but in the 1960s, some guy said, I dug up, if you go to Fort Moultrie, it's right there, it's in the front, you can walk right up to the thing. You don't even have to go into the fort, it's in the front of it. Uh, I saw it a few years ago, and I didn't, it didn't even dawn on me what it was till I walked up to it, because it's just kind of there. Um, but uh, in the 60s, this man proclaimed, I dug up the bones of Osceola, and he doesn't have a head. Well, that made people go, well, we've got to check this out. Well, it turned out that man had dug near the grave and dug up some animal bones. But then archaeologists said, well, we've got to check on this. 
And so they dug up the body, and sure enough, there was only a body. There was no head. So they decapitated him and pickled his head. I don't know if they know where the head is now. Um, the other thing is, there's a legend in Charleston that if you go to the grave of Osceola at midnight and you say derogatory things about him, his headless corpse will come and get you. So if you want to try, you can go right up there. Um, the war didn't end then, but it kind of the, the heart of the matter, you know, they, they, they lost their heart and their head when they lost uh, Osceola. There was another uh, chief who was taken prisoner at the same time. By the way, John Horse was taken prisoner as well. And this is his cell. Um, there's a, a bench that goes, this concrete or, or stone bench that goes, it's about three feet high, and then the only light comes from this little narrow window. Wildcat, John Horse, several other uh, chieftains were in there with Osceola. Osceola was too ill to try this, but the other one stood on each other's uh, shoulders and they broke through, there was a, uh, you know, a metal bar there, they sawed through it, and then they crawled through it, tearing their flesh, because it's, as you can see, it's very narrow. But I think it's 16, yes, uh, so 18 escaped. They, felt they, they just had to drop into a molt, moat on the other side, and then they escaped, they took off, and went south, further south than the fighting had been so far. The biggest battle of the war was the Battle of Lake Okeechobee, 1837. Um, Jessup is still in charge, but there's a, a new commander in the field, and that's a guy named Zachary Taylor. Zachary Taylor's going to become president. Um, not so much for what he did here as what he did when he fought Mexico. Um, one of the things I want to point out, and this is true of the whole, to uh, whole time of the, the Seminole War, they had the best scouts. They knew the territory. So they always knew when the army was coming. The army could never surprise them. It was one of the frustrating things about the war. If the Indians didn't want to fight, they didn't have to fight because they always knew, see, see the guy down here? They always knew when the uh, soldiers were coming. At Lake Okeechobee, I'm going to go ahead and go, that's Zachary Taylor. That's a uh, hammock. See the, the ground around here? In, at Lake Okeechobee, the Indians got the hammock and they taunted the uh, soldiers. They basically let them know we're here and the ground looked firm. So Zachary Taylor has them charge with their horses. Pretty soon they were dismounting their horses because the horses are stuck. And these guys were volunteers from Missouri. They came charging straight ahead, not the best strategy because that just meant every Seminole could shoot into the crowd. And they basically beat him for most of the, the battle, but then a man came, uh, he sent a man around behind and they eventually had to drop back. It's the biggest battle of the war. And let's see, just one more thing that, uh, this is uh, Jessup saying as he's left, he, he leaves and gives command to Zachary Taylor to keep doing what we're doing. We are, uh, we've already done this for three years. It's a reckless waste of blood and treasure. This is costing us too much money. We're accomplishing too little. By the way, he had given in so much, he offered at one point, we'll just give you all the land south of Lake Okeechobee. No, he said, no white guys want to live there. But Washington wouldn't, wouldn't let them uh, do that. And so here's what the government lost in the Second Seminole War. It took six and a half years total. Um, it's the most costly of all Indian wars combined. Yet we don't remember it. The armed forces sustained 1,466 service deaths and an indeterminate number of losses from wounds and disease. Uh, it cost it's somewhere in the neighborhood of $40 million to the United States Treasury and property losses. Again, all those plantations. There was a third war 
basically, I'm not going to go through all this, but basically it was getting the last of the Seminoles in the 1850s to get out. But what I liked about this, it wasn't really a war at all. Uh, the Indians just avoided the soldiers. Uh, look here. This is Abner Doubleday, by the way. Abner Doubleday, who was at the start of the Civil War and didn't start baseball. But he, he participated here. We had no success in the Indian question, whatever. How could we have? They kept out of our way and let us wander around. So, it, again, it wasn't much of a war. And here are the results. 400 black Seminoles and escaped slaves were recaptured or captured. So this war did bring about 400, uh, and some number of those being black Seminole, being sold into slavery. But if you look at what it cost the army, three white men died for every slave, every black enslaved in the war. So pretty costly if you're not a slaveholder. 4,000 Seminole were shipped west. John Horse surrendered after the Battle of Lake Okeechobee. And first he went to Indian Territory, but then he took his people to Mexico. So there's a Seminole presence to this day in Mexico. He died in Mexico City uh, sometime after the Civil War. And then I want to leave you with this map, which shows all the different uh, slave rebellions. Again, we always think of Turner's over here as the biggest. Proportionately speaking, you can see how much bigger the uh, slave rebellion along the St. John's River was compared to those. Thank well, thank you. you.